Of Daron, would you like to, we, we, um, I'm going to ask you to make some comments. Oh, no, no, jeez, no. I'm just, yeah. I understand, but, but because we're a special guy, we, uh, we're here doing a Tzorim Rabbonon, Volume 1. Um, we have a very special guest with us tonight in Los Angeles, Harav Daron Podlashuk, who is the director of the Manigut Toranit program, who is actually the English translator. All the English translations that we are benefiting from, as we learn through the, uh, as we've learned through Tzorim Rabbonon, Volume 1, has been translated by Rav Daron. We welcome him, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him. He is a uh, Torah scholar of the, of the first magnitude and is training many religious Zionist uh, Rabbonim in Eretz Yisrael in the Torah Money Good program that's, that are being sent all over the world. I'm told there's a, there's a Shlichim now being sent to Australia, to Cleveland, in London, and uh, Toronto. So um, that's fantastic. So today we're going to do uh, page 206 is where we left off and we're going to finish Hilchos Pesa Zaken and uh, shaving our beards and hopefully we'll also do and maybe even finish Hilchos Shiluch Haken today. Um, I'm just going to say some contemporary, some contemporary post scheme suggests a second reason for leniency regarding the shaving of the beard based on another difference between a shaver and a razor. The area that a razor can shave is unlimited, as one can move it across one's whole face and cut all of the hair simultaneously. But with regard to scissors, the area in which it can operate is limited to the hairs in between the two blades, which is true for a shaver as well, as it can only sh shave the hair in between the two blades inside the shaver. If you remember, we had the problem of uh, putting the blade directly against the skin. So here, perhaps the problem is mitigated. Therefore, it is permitted like a scissors, says Rav Shabtai Rappaport, son-in-law of Havrav Moshe Feinstein and the Igris Moshe. Based on this logic, a lift and cut shaver, which picks up the hair directly from the skin and then cuts it, would also be permitted. This is a position taken by the Tzomet Institute. Tzomet Institute is in Israel that comes up with, uh, hi Johnny, hi. comes up with many uh, new mechanisms of leniencies or whatever the halacha is regarding halacha. So a shave and cut where the, where the hair is presented, uh, according to this position, would be permitted. We're going to see some other post game of a problem with that. Now, another leniency is that in biblical and Talmudic times, only razors, planes, and tweezers were used for shaving. But a scissor was not forbidden, since at that time, it was not really effective as a razor. When the store states hashchasa, right, uh, that the whole problem is to be mashchis, going down to the root of the, where the hair is, not to destroy it. It's referring to the implement which is forbidden to use for shaving, like a, sh like a straight blade. Therefore, even if in later times there are other implements that give the same results as a razor, that means we get a smooth enough shave with an electric razor, but it doesn't have the same hashchasa concept, they are permitted nonetheless. Since those implements, the scissor, were never implemented by the Torah. That's what Rav Eliyahu Weisfish in HaChashmal Bahalacha, which is a kuntras that deals with electricity and halachic issues. However, others have rejected this approach. Since the Torah itself never actually refers to a razor, only to the concept of Ashkasa. So it's difficult to say based on that the Torah referred to a specific instrument, but is rather for, is focused more on the action, what actually that instrument does. And that's what Rav Shlomo Zaman in Mincha Shlomo says, that be a Omer, which we'll mention as we read. Another grounds for leniency was mentioned by Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank that Rav, we will read in Rav Avadio Yosef's comments today, who permits only when one shaves loosely and does not allow the skin to come too close to the screen of the shaver. So if, if, if you don't you know, hold it really tight, but you do it somewhat loosely, that might be a leniency. Although even in this case, one may occasionally cut the hairs like a razor. It's a dover shalom is coming. It's unintentional. And it's not a definite occurrence. We know the concept of seek ratio. There's a machlokas thing more between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon regarding dover shalom is coming. Like, for example, on Shabbos, if you do a malacha without the kavona, for example, if you drag a bed from this corner to that corner and you make a, a ditch in the, in the ground. So you're not allowed to do a binyan on Shabbos, but you, that was not your intent. So Rabbi Yudas says it's Osir, because Dovashem is Kavin is Osir, Rabbi Shemin is Matir. Now, it's not guaranteed 
that you're going to make the ditch when you drag the bed. But for example, if you're going to cut the head of the chicken off and say it's not going to die, let's say you want to use the blood for fertilizer. Your intent is not to kill the chicken, it's for another reason. But psik reish of aloyomos, you can't cut the psik reish, cut the head off and it's not going to die. Something that we know automatically is going to happen, you have even Rab Shimon is moida that a dover shem is kavain, is going to be usr. So, but here might be not a psik reish, because it's not a definite occurrence. According to this logic, a lift and cut shaver might be forbidden that is designed to pluck the hairs from the skin and then cut it off. So that would, that would be a problem because there's a kavona. Let's see the Abiyah Omer in, 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 in Sin. It says, Uva hagos har tzvi al hatur yoridea kosav hagon ratzvi pesach frank shekeven she'etzam ha'sakin shalom achona since the knife of the machine is ena nogea v'lo pogea be'or upon him. It's really not even touching the skin at all. There's a scream. There's this. Nesheyesh hefsek dak shel hareshes b'neim. There's a very thin sort of interference. There's the net netting. La haviela keintar. So it's only like a razor. Vishori. That's what Rav Tzvi Pesach. That's the Rabbi Vadia quoting Rav Tzvi Pesach that seemed to be mud. The kach kosav agon Rav Tzvi Pesach right by mechtovo elai. Look at this. Biyom yudchas tomus tafshin yud beis. That's 1952. Mm-hmm. So Rav, Rav Yosef is remi- a letter that Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank wrote to him. Of course, Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank was one of the Gedolei HaPoskim at the time that the State of Israel was created. Many of the, you know, the issues of like an electric utility, how do you run an electric utility on Shabbos? Dams, how various things were done in the army. He was, he, he was one of the major early post game that dealt with a lot of the modern issues in in Eretz Yisrael. So the kach kosov agon rov tzeis lepech in 1952 lachrona hu vu lifanai mechonot giluach meshuchlalat hapolat edei chashmal. Rav Tzvi Pesach Reich is saying that recently they brought to his attention some new electric razors. Remember 1952 Norelko, Phillips, it's probably the time that handheld mm-hmm. razors first became available. First of all, he saw that people who use it to shave, Nase Orpneim Cholak Lagamri, comes very smooth. We see that in practice, this is really shaving. So maybe it should be considered like a tar, like a razor. So I, I tell people who asks me, she is our upon him. Don't stick it too close to the skin. When he does not place the savers tightly against the skin, as psikresha, we don't have this issue where it's vada gonna happen that way. Vishori says a sweet pace of Frank. Now the Chalkas Yaakov. Say it again. How can you hold it not so close? You go like this. Instead of holding your skin tight, right? If you feel it rough, you you do, you, you leave your skin loose, right. and he's and he's just saying that that might be a way to avoid a halachic problem. I see in the commentary below it's talking about a Phillips uh, shaver. Right? It's a lift and cut. That's the one that he's referring to. That it, yeah, that we can hold it held loosely. That's it. So nice. It is also that noteworthy is that in the continuation of the response from Avad Yor to above, he cites another letter from the Yitzchak Yiranin that appears to refer to a lift and cut shaver, a new model Philip shaver, where an additional sharper part was added, and the hair that enters the holes of the screen is pulled and then cut, where Rav Barda says that this too is permitted, since it still operates like a scissor. This is also the position of some prominent current post in the United States. Mm-hmm. We're going to see, though, later on t- today, that some will say that since that's lifting the skin and bringing it in, that that may be problematic because it's getting too close to the root. Okay, but there's certainly pe- there's there's, there's certainly people to so certainly we have a leniency. We say Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank. If you don't do it too tightly, it's clearly giving us. Uh, a leniency so that is permitted. Screen, the, Say it again? The, the, the screen. screen. Well, I don't know of any that don't have the screen. No, the right. new ones really Walter, uh, just wanted to introduce This is Rav Daron um, Podlashuk from South Africa. Okay. By the way, Rav Walter, he told me that the author of the Tzurva Rabban has been in Hebrew for 10 years. So there's been cycles in Israel 
going. There's, he says there's about a thousand shiurim in Eretz Yisrael, and the one who wrote it is a Rav Al-Ghazi, who was a Ram in Kerem Biyavda. You remember Rav Al-Ghazi? Maybe he's after you. Okay. The Chalkas Yaakov was a prominent European posik. At the time that Rav Moshe <coughs> was writing the Igris Moshe, the Chalkas Yaakov, Rav Yaakov Breish in Zurich, was writing also his Shas and Shuvis, which, f- like for us, the Igris Moshe in America, really the Chalkas Yaakov was in Europe. And all sorts of modern posts, all sorts of modern questions about in artificial insemination, and all the various issues that were brought in front of Rav Moshe was also brought in Chalkas Yaakov. It's very interesting, sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't, dis- sometimes they disagree. I have a connect, personal connection to the Chalkas Yaakov because Rav Breish is a member of the Carniol family. And during the war, our family was the Carniol family, all the mail that went to each other was sent via Rabbi Breish in Switzerland. So, um, so he is part, you know, we have a distant family with Rav, Rav, Rav Breish. He's not alive, but his son is still active in Zurich, Rav, the Chalkas Yaakov's son. And, uh, uh, and Itshu knows Rav Breish and he's, that, that, that uh, Stiebel still exists in, in Zurich. So, Chalkas Yaakov, Alach Lamaisa, Hacharedim Bepo, right here in Zurich, Noagim Heter, Bemachonis Remington Shik, that that they there the, those who the Haredim they use that shaver. He wants to make sure we know. So like Sydney said, there should always be a screen outside the blade. He wants to say the whole. He's giving us the gedorim of what makes a kosher shaver. He says the holes should be very 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 small. Why? Not to suck skin in. Which could then cut the the, the, the the hair at the root. So they told him, Sha'af. Sha'af, Mifuram Sa'el Yesh Machono Shonos, in the marketplace there's many machines, Binakovim Ktanim, that you can buy, you can find with small holes. Gamadatek Lematuacha or Shalabosa Bishasakfa. Here he says, be careful to pulling the skin very uh, tight. Uh, because in that, because 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 we want to make sure that the skin doesn't get sucked in. The way Rav Pesach which we just read, had paskin. That you shouldn't pull the skin tight when you're doing the shaving. So okay, now the Olad Yosef brings another suggestion for permitting the shavers in the name of Rav Shlomo Zavon Arbach and writes that Rav Moshe Feinstein also permitted them as far as Iker Adin, a strict Allah. Let's see what Rav Adyo Yosef says. V'agon Rav Shlomo Zavon Arbach b'shus min chas shloyma chelik beiz, kosav, svor l'hakel b'zei he gave a certain reason why to be lenient. Sheb'em ashe yesh chiluk gadol be'mechonat giluach l'tar there's a huge difference between an electric machine that shaves and a straight razor. Shehatar moirid mamish at kola sar, sheboilet mahabosar imashoirish. The blade removes all the hair that protrudes from the skin together with the root. Ve'ilu b'mechonat giluach muchrach l'shayr shamashu. With an electric razor, there's always the material left. It doesn't pull the whole thing out. Umashanir achalak kimovatar. Ay, the fact that if you check a person after he shaves, it seems pretty... Smooth. Mm-hmm. The machine sort of pulls in a little of the hair that's underneath the skin. Really you could call it the root. root. But there's still some hair remnant from that. So the hair drops recedes. back, recedes back into the skin. Let me ask you, if you took out it, it with a straight blade, right? You took out the, the root. The root. It still grows back. The root, what, what, it doesn't it, the root it, yeah, back. it does grow back, because you, people do right. grow hair right. after so they shave. So how's it taking out the skin? What's that shkosa? If you're moving it with the root, then the root comes back. Ah, it's taking out the root. Then I understand the difference. of that root. The root and the hair. The hair, but not the follicle that produces the hair. That's the question. 
That's the difference. It has to do with it has to do with the depth. Hold on a second. Is that scientifically proven? Yeah, we we certainly people's hair grow back. They don't just destroy completely. Then why do you call it root? It has to do with depth. It has to do with depth. If if you're cutting deep enough that this root is being effective. That's what the tar does. And the electric razors don't go that deep. Hey, but if you're not cutting your skin, you have no blood on your skin. We don't have blood, usually. You don't have blood. But razors do. You see people, sometimes they do nick exactly. themselves. Exactly. They nick themselves. That's actually, that's actually, that actually itself is a very interesting horror. That people would shave with a blade very often. Cut get themselves. nicked. Very right? often. Get nicked. No, they cut themselves. Like, they nick. Not, they nick. Yeah. nick, whatever. With, with electric shaver, you know, that doesn't... Very, very shows you that you're not get exactly as Rav, Rav uh, that he's quoting Rishlam Azaman, the the, the, ray, the electric razor is not cutting as deep. But he's trying to explain why this why there is a smooth feeling because it, it does get some of the root probably doesn't get all of it. So tar gets more of it, but not all of it. If you if you need the root to grow back more hair. It certainly doesn't take well, we, away we all know, of the root. Most of our homes would know. I mean, not, I mean, I just, I how, would, how would you know? We would never but the I mean, shave with, with the blade. blade. Just take yeah, the blade. Ask someone to shave right? the blade what it's like compared to a... To a to You're right. Or, it's probably or, smoother. Much smoother. Yeah. yeah. Skin, uh, we know that. Now, al <laughs> koponim, <laughs> So if you don't tighten up your skin too much, you can rely on this Leniency. Shuv nitfas sefer mega givot to lama eight haravagon mechels zalman shorkin. Talmidim shall go to Rav Moshe Feinstein. One of the Talmidim of Rav Feinstein. Shorkin. I think it may be the one who wrote the uh, Rav Yosha Bears. No, right? There's a Rav Shorkin who some of the no, shiur. Uh, the, no, what's the Harei Kedem? Wasn't that also written by Rav Shorkin? No, Harei Kedem is Yosha No, no, no. But Rav Shorkin. I think is the one who brought it together, and one of the reasons why the Haredi Kedem is today it's quite accepted even in the Haredi communities is because Rav Shurkin is the one who put it together. I believe it's the same Rav Shurkin. So, anyways, Rav Shurkin said, "Kazu b'shmo," he's saying in the name of Moshe. There are different reasons why to be lenient. Because the the blade cuts the the the, the star from its root. One time Rav Moshe was asked by Tamil Chacham, is there a reason to be stringent by the new electric razors? Mm-hmm. He already matir, but now there were newer ones. Mm-hmm. So what about, would he continue to be lenient? Would he continue to be lenient? This is this. Uh, there's now more of a of of a of, of a cutting, perhaps the new lift and cut. Although uh, it's not said here, but because the newer ones have this new lift and cut technology, he made sort of a, a comment that you don't have to be machmir. like cutting chalus on Shabbos because of koitzer to say you don't have to go that far regarding uh, stringency. He didn't write it clearly as a heter. He might agree that maker adin min Torah it's not being mashchitz, and perhaps there's a reason. A Jew is supposed to have a beard. So, so what is how does how does Rav Avadi Yosef conclude his little article? Maskonas did not call ishi yochel legadel zukano. If you can trim, first of all, you should try, try whoever can grow their beard should grow their beard. If you can co- co- connect it with scissors, not in a way of a blade, you should do that. Let's say your job doesn't allow you to come in without with clean without unless you were clean shaven. Maybe his wife doesn't like it. Uh, it's going to lead to lack of problems with Shalom bias mm-hmm. if he has a beard. Umegachim zakena, and he they shave their beard. Mechonek ilo chashmalid. Yesh lehem al mashi yismachu. He says we have there are poskim that you can rely on. Uvavad she's our shalom hadik zamechona elor upon him. You shouldn't do it too tightly. Kadesh lo yakor aseir mishor shol. According to this approach, it would seem that one who uses to use, one who wishes to use a lift and cut shaver should first 
remove the lift and cut mechanism. And there's a way to do it when you go, if you go into a, a store to buy and it says lift and cut, they can remove that mechanism. As that is what causes the hair to be uprooted from the skin. The, some of the newer models, it says we it does lift and cut. Sometimes, so if you go on the OU, or there's certain, if you go, if you look, if you do a search that says kosher shavers, you're gonna see lists, and it'll tell you this is what because the ones that they say are a problem is lift and cut. Now we understand why, because it's sucking in the hair from from being too deep. So avoid that. Make sure there's a screen, and make sure we don't do it tight then you have uh, plenty of leniencies. The entire discussion of the poskim is on the level of standard of normative halacha. However, some poskim, such as the Chida, there's a fantastic uh, biography of the Chida, I think coming up in the Shulach Khan. He lived in Yushalayim. He was sent as a, uh, sh- uh, a shalich to sure. Europe. And uh, he was. And he wanted to be buried in Israel, but he died in Italy. And 154 <laughs> years later, he was buried in Har Menuchos. So the Chida is buried in the Har Menuchos. <laughs> yeah. No, Shalich to raise money for the Yishuv of Yerushalayim. No, he, he lived during the time of the Orachayim, who also lived in Yerushalayim at that time. So the Chida writes that according to the Kabbalah, it is completely forbidden to shave one's beard at all. This is based on a passage in the Zohar and the opinion of the Arizal, signed by the Chida and the Ben Ishchai. Nevertheless, Rav Yosef, Yosef, Rav Levi Yosef quoted some opinions that claimed that even according to Rizal, it is only forbidden to shave when uprooting the hairs from the roots, but otherwise it would be permitted. Wow. Right? So that means Rav Yosef is going to take up the fact that the Mukubolim say not to shave. Shanir de lav mil sepsiktihi. Shagam she'en la esek ben stars. If you shouldn't shave at all, you have to have a beard. So, okay. so even though he says, I have no... Well, Nazar, though, can't cut, cut his hair either. His, the hair on his head. You, in other words, you can't shave it, but could you trim it? It, it seems like there's a midas chasidus, according to Zohar, that you should not, that, that, that the beard should not be cut. Shave one's beard at all. Doesn't mean, we don't know yet, it doesn't mean you can't trim it. Let's just see. So Ravad Yosef Shein Lanu Esek Benistoros Ulam Hine Raiti B'shut B'shut Rav Paolim Shehevi Divrei Harizal B'shartam and Mitzvos and Parshas Kedoshim She Isur Godel Hu La Akor Od Litlosh Biyado You can't uproot the hair from its root or to tear it out with your hand. Afilu Sar Achos Mikol Mokom Even one hair. Kihem Tzi Noras Hashafa. I guess hair. Right. So I'm going to say the is it's, you cannot uproot it from the root. Or to tear it with your hand, even one hair. The Arizal talked about pipes and channels that would coming from a Kodesh Baruch Hu, channels of bracha, etc. And the hairs, I guess, are part of that. A person should not like twirl his hand. You know how people they yeah, play with their play beard because you might come and pull out a hair. And he says even one hair is a problem. You have to put it in the Gemara after Paul's out. So this is Walter's point that the Arizal only had a problem in cutting it completely, but necessarily trimming it with with a scissor. For if you didn't take it all out, maybe it wouldn't be a problem. If the hair root is staying where it is, you're only trimming it. Okay, so we're going to use that as our uh, summary. Because we were reminded of what we learned last week regarding um, the the uh, shape. Now we're going to move on to our last halacha in volume one, Hilchos Shiloh Hakain. We will study the halachas. We're on page two nineteen. In this year, we'll study the halachas of Shiloh Hakain, a relatively uncommon mitzvah today, but a special one for those who are privileged to fulfill it, because the Torah teaches us that there's a positive mitzvah to send a mother bird away before taking her young or her eggs. So if you come come across a nest and a a mother bird is sitting on her eggs or her young progeny, you have to chase the mother bird away. How you do that, we're going to learn tonight, before taking the young. And Hashem promises long life to those who fulfill it. Furthermore, there's a love there's a negative prohibition to take the mother together with her young. Now, what's the source of these halachas? So in Dvarm Chav Beis, 
we know the pasuk ki kare kansi por lefanecha baderech bechol eitz ola aretz efrochim o beitzim. There's either chicks or eggs. Ve'aim rovesetz ala efrochim ola beitzim, and the mother is on the nest. Lo tika ha'aim ala bonim. You shouldn't take the mother with the children. But rather shalech to shalach ha'aim. First, send the mother away. Should be good for you, and you should have a long life. Rashi ki kare prat lemezuman means you have to find it. You can't set it up. We're going to see, for example, if it's in your house on your property, that might be a, a, it's already considered mezuman. It's already there. It means it has to. You have to. It's happenstance. You can't arrange this kind. You can't stage it. Can you go and look for it? Hang on. Lo tikach aim. But Odal Bana says Rashi, while it's still on its young. Laman Yitavlach, he says, a mitzvah kalash ain't bochi soren kiss. Here you have a mitzvah where there's no financial loss. Amra Tor Laman Yitavlach rachta yamim. The Torah says, you will have long life. Kalvachor, Lamat Nuschor, Shomitzus Chamuras. How much greater? If you have greater mitzvahs that, that, with a lot of financial loss, you buy a little of an estrog that costs you know, $150 in Los Angeles. You, you know, and other very expensive mitzvahs or mitzvahs that take a lot of time and effort, etc. Kavachim. What's the basis for this mitzvah? For example, the Tama mitzvah. Commentaries offer a few possible reasons for this unusual mitzvah. The Chsam Soifer cites one region mentioned by the Ramban that we are enjoined not to be cruel to the mother. He also cites a more mystical explanation given by the Chavis Yoyer in the name of the Zohar. So let's see the Chsam Soifer in the Shul Chatam Soifer Chelek Aleph. The Ayin Ramban Binimuke Chumash Shalo, where in his translation of the Chumash, Kosa, Vitama Mitzvahi. He gave the reason. Shalon is Achzer la Akor Emal Bonim. We shouldn't be cruel to uproot the mother while she's there with her children. Now, the Afa Gav the Osr Loimar Al Kan Sipor Yagira Chamecha, the Gemara, or the Mishnah in Brochos, says, you're not, you're not allowed to say to Hashem, right? Your mercy comes upon the nest of a bird, right? Because God's mercy doesn't apply to animals where there's a human need. If there's a whole, if we know you can't have unnecessary tzar balechayim, but the Torah, the Hashem created the world for man's use, and we we use animals. For example, we shech them for meat, and if the so af gzeres heinalenu shlo nilmod lizachz of niska midaseinu, but we, but there's still ways for us to learn how we should control our midas and not be cruel. Ayn shan b'nei lefidam zemavur dim ainot tzarch lebonim. Now let's say you don't need the eggs or the chicks. Lo mabai dinim chuyi l'shalachem. There's no question that you shouldn't send the mother bird away. It's the only leave it alone. It's only if you need the eggs that you do it. In fact, doing that, it just shows you're cruel. In a place that we're supposed to learn not to be cruel, we're going to become cruel. Just to chase the mother bird away, we want to have a fun, like like a kid will pluck the you know the, the wings off of a, uh, off of a fly. So absolutely not. There's a Zohar concept that the, 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 the when you when you when they chase the mother bird away. Different reason. Zohar gives a mystical reason. When you chase the mother bird away from its child, from its children, it's going to cry. That crying is somehow going to bring mercy of a Kodesh Baruch who realize, give mercy on his children. In in that's somehow that's what the Zohar is trying to say. No, the, I'm saying if you by he's saying the reason for the mitzvah of, of shiluach hakain is to chase the mother bird away. That will cause the mother bird to cry, and this is somehow going to be the, uh, uh, will arouse an akodesh baruch hu for us as well. Because you see pictures every year they have pictures of rebbes they take them out in the forest and they find. Uh, 
So we're going to see in a minute. Should are we are we right, are we that, supposed to look for it? Yeah, right. okay. exactly. We saw based on what you just said. Unless you need the eggs, there's no reason. Yeah. To that's, step yeah. that's step one. That's step one. That's step one. According to the Chatam Sofer, not according to the Chovat Yair. Right. The Chovat Yair says there's a, there's some there's kind a of mystical a benefit, benefit to. Mm-hmm. We saw previously that the Torah promises a reward of long life. For one who fulfills this mission, Rav Shlomo Eger, Eger writes in his commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, based on the Sefer Achinuch, citing the Midrash Tan Chuma, that an additional dimension of reward for this mitzvah is that one can merit to have children as a result. So it's a school for children. He says in the Gilead Marsha, Uvischar mitzvahu Adam Zoich Lebonim, the cause of the Sefer Achinuch, the Darash, the Asabonim Tikachlach, when the Pasuk says, You shall take the children, return a lomar, lenafshachach, for yourself. That means if you if, if you're somebody who's having a hard problem having children, it's a school of for bunny. Now, what about sending away the mother when you don't take the young? Although Shiloh Haken is clearly a Torah requirement, it seems logical that it cannot be the same type of obligation as other positive mitzvahs, as one does not frequently encounter a mother bird sitting on a nest. Moreover, even should one see a nest, one doesn't always wish to take and make use of the young. So to what extent must, was, must one go out of one's way mm-hmm. to fulfill this mitzvah? The Gemara clarifies that one does not have to search for a nest in order to perform it. Ton Rabbonon says in Masech Tachulon, Ki kare kan si prol fanecha, ma tamad lo emar, lefi shenem ar shalech te shalach asa'em, vesabonim tikach lachot, you're supposed to send the mother bird, word, mother bird away and take the children, yachol yachzer bohar mukvos, I might think, you have to go searching in valleys and mountains, Kadeshi and Sakan to find a nest, Tamud Lamar. Ki kare. It has to be happenstance. You're not required to search it out. It's if it happens. You come upon it. Nevertheless, the Chida in the Birka Yosef cites the Arizo, who holds that one should try to go out of one's way to find a nest so that one may perform this mitzvah. So, Sydney. We can see if the Hasidic Rebbes are going out, they're following the Arizal, who anybody, seems to... Anybody, you tell them that it's guaranteed you a long life, they're going to look for that mitzvah, they're going to go out in the fields and look for that mitzvah. It tells you the schar is, on, is right there. That Ava gav de lufi mashmos hashas, diktani, yachol yachzer, but you might have a havamina to think you should go out and look for it. Muchach dein achiv lachzer l'kai mitzvah zu, but medivrei Arizal mashma, should tzorach lishtad l'kai mitzvah zu. So the Arizal says, even though the shas says you don't have to, he says you should be zaris to it. The Chassam Soifer quote, we're on page 223. It's worthwhile seeing the Chidah's biography later. Chassam Soifer quoted earlier notes that this position of the Arizal is based on the reason given for the mitzvah by the Zohar, that it is meritorious for us to arouse the crying for mercy of the mother for its young, as this can also arouse Hashem's mercy for us, his children. But the Chassam Soifer claims that since this goes against the clear implication of the Gemara side above, the halacha is that there is no obligation to go look for a, a khan. Because the Gemara seems to come out from its maskana that you don't have a chiyu. Omnam. Omnam, right, the chavis yar said, we want to increase the cry of the mother. has nothing to do with this issue of Correcting our meters about being cruel. Even we see that for human benefit, Hashem didn't have necessarily mercy on the fact that we don't shecht animals. So it doesn't work that way. So even though we're doing it for mitzvah, but our Gemara's maskona was not like that. That whenever there's a machlokas between halacha, nigla, the Gemara, which was written very clear for all of us to learn, versus Nister, hidden Chachma, the Zohar, which was ha- ha- handed down person to person. It's not as it's Nister. In Lanu Esek Benistaros, Vahaniglos Lanu Levanenu. We follow the Niglos as a Soifer, and there's no Chiyu. So, but even if one does not go out of his way to search for a nest, one may happen to find a nest with a mother bird, and there may be chicks there or eggs. And he doesn't have any use for the chicks and eggs. And this is often the case today. We don't usually go out hunting for chicks and eggs. We go to the Ralph's Market for our chicks and eggs. And we, go, we don't keep chicks or chickens on our property. We generally buy our legs from the store. So 
in that situation, mm -hmm. you come across a, a nest, and the mother bird is there, and there are chickens, and there are chicks there, or even eggs there. What do you do? Is there an obligation to fulfill this mitzvah? So Rav Yair Bakrak in, in, addresses this case in his <coughs> response to Chavos Yair and claims that although the Gemara indicates one need not search for a nest, if one chances upon one, he must perform the mitzvah. So apparently the obligation to send the mother away... Apparently the obligation to send the mother away is independent of whether of, of one... Whether one whether one wants the child or not, mm -hmm. but it's Let, counterintuitive because sending away your mother from lying on the nest of her of her young, it's like you know you're causing harm, emotional harm, distress to the mother. Yeah, that's what the, I mean. The, the, that's what. Uh, but if you have Ari a purpose, saying that yeah. Ari's all saying that that's there's that's a positive really component positive to that. For, for but birth. but the question is, is it only when you have a need for the egg? That means to stop send the mother bird even if you don't need the egg. That's apparently what he's saying here. You do the mitzvah, if you come on. Well, let's see what he says. The question is, you don't need the eggs, okay? But you throw, you chase away the mother. You, you take the eggs. The You're not doing and what if, the eggs. And then you can put back the eggs and finish. No, let's see what You're he says. Not touching the eggs. Yeah. No, let's say you take him from the nest it's and like you put him back after you did it. You put she him back. Let's read. Let's read the shud chavos. You should do the mitzvah. Sheela nishalti im ki karek kansi por lifnei ish basadeh. Person's walking in the field, and he happens ac he happens across a, f a, a nest. Is he does he have a chiv to send the mother away, or or can he just bypass the nest and go on his way? He doesn't have to do anything. That perhaps the Torah only said, "Go ahead and chase the mother away if you want the child." But if you don't need the child or the eggs. You don't necessarily have to be a metapel with the mother. Near it. Let's see how he answers. Let's be a says the Chavos Yor from the Gemara. I might think you'd have to go searching in mountains. It's only when one chances upon it that the mitzvah applies. And it's not like to go hunting for it. Hachim is tavr latam shakaz of a And this sort of fits with the Zohar reasoning about the mercy. Shehu g'day sha'ov, the bird, ema oifos, titzta'er, will be in pain. V'tifrach mimokam lamokam, it will hop from place to place, looking for its children. L'vakesh espanah. V'ayidei kach, yizgagalu rachmi amokam, through that action, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have mercy on us. L'chein nirele, so he says, if you come across the nest, you should do it. It's only a suffix chiyuv. It's not an absolute obligation. But you should be machmir. In, in all cases, since it's derisa. Suffix lach, suffix derisa, lachmir. This ruling of the Chavos Yor is quoted by many achronim, including the Birke Yosef. But Rabbi Kiva Eger, the Shulchan Aruch, and the Pilsley Tshuva mentioned that. However, Chaim Kanievsky notes that the Ran states the opposite of the Chavos Yor, that if you come across a nest, you don't have to do anything, you can just walk away. Where does the Ran say that? Shiluach mi'avi mitzvah mutel salav, harayim lo ratzalika chabanim, partim neshaleach. So the Ran says very clearly that if you don't need the children, you, you're partim from sending it away. Some achronim, including the Chazon Yish, rule this way, that there's no obligation of shiluach hakein, if one does actually not want to take the eggs of the chicks. What's the chazon you say in your idea? The impaga became, if he came across the nest, there was a story in the Gemara. Between, well, let's hold off. We're going to go back to. Let, let, there's a footnote that explains the Gemara. We'll go through it next. Yeah, but the Peace. Torah, the Torah tells you if you happenstance they come across a, a, a nest and it has the chicks and the mother, send the mother bird away and take the chicks. Only if, if you, you want, want the chicks. Where does it say so? Straight from the Torah. That doesn't say, it says, it says. It says so. Right. So we see there. We see. So we see there's a machlokus rishonim, the Ran, and the Chavos Yar. It gave so, you a special mitzvah. It gave. 
Yeah, mitzvahs get you to do mitzvahs. You're supposed to do mitzvahs. It implies that only if you need it. You could argue the same thing about shechita. Is there a mitzvah to go and shecht an animal? Or if you want to have a steak, you have to shecht the animal. It's not an obligation. So it's the same. It's not a chiyuv to shecht. We're not through. Walter, your question will continue to hang here. It's not the same, because basically, you muftach a lot of things when you do this. You know, when you eat meat, you muftach cholesterol. And other <laughs> you're saying it doesn't say yaman <laughs> arichu yamecha. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't okay. you're not muftach arichus yamim, you're not muftach to have children. You know, it's a special mitzvah yeah, you're doing where you can get a lot of schut for, from it. So why would... Uh, We're talking about the chiyuv. So, so certainly I, if somebody... I, I understand, but a guy doesn't have children. Oh, suddenly he came across a, a thing. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. But he knows that that's what the mitzvah is because he's going to get schar for it. And he knows that it says that he's going to get arich yom in for it. So why wouldn't you do but it? Because what if the mitzvah doesn't apply if you have no rotsen for the bonim? Mm-hmm. Sending the mother birds away is not going to accrue a mitzvah mm-hmm. for him. Mm-hmm. If, if according to the Ran, you're potter mil shaleach, now, just like women are potter from shaking the lulav, but Ashkenazi women, we, we say that if they shake the mitzvah, they have a, they, they're allowed to do it, and they can make a bracha on it as well. So it's the same thing. Maybe even according to the Ran, who says, you're potter, if a person wants to do the mitzvah, you, it's certainly, it's not forbidden to do it. Uh, yeah. Okay. What about if you found a, find a nest in your property? I, once, I have a balcony out of my bedroom, and uh, uh, the nest was, I, there was once a nest with eggs with a mother bird in it. So it's exactly this case. You we saw, the eggs? Say again? <laughs> no. No, but it was a complicated <laughs> issue. See, the problem is we are now the owners of that. And you can't, if you're the owners, it's, it's a mizuman. It's already prepared. So it's, it's, you're going to have to do it in a way where you make a tnai that somehow if eggs go up in a, in a nest, it won't belong to you. Otherwise, since it belongs to you already, you don't get the mitzvah because it's part. It's already been prepared. Well, let's see it. We saw Bavin Rashi's commentary on the Torah that the mitzvah shluch ken does not apply to every single nest. Rather, the words "when you happen" indicate that it applies only where the nest is not considered mizuman, which literally means made available, readily available. This term is used to limit the mitzvah to situations where a nest is situated in places that the mother bird can fly away easily. That's one get there, or are not in one's property. That's another getter. If it's, if it's in your property, it's considered mizuman. If, if the bird and the mother's in a place where it can't really move, it's also considered that you didn't fulfill it. However, nests located in one's possession or places which the person can catch the bird should he so desire generally not included. Meaning, if you can easily catch the mother bird, if it's very confined, you're not going to be kind of the mitzvah of shiluach. The, the mother has to be able to run away. So that's another problem that says that it will, it will not be a mitzvah in that situation. Where is the source? In the Mishnah. In Chol. That's why birds always make nests where they can fly off. Why do you have to do that? We're talking about uh, chickens and geese that made their nest in a field. But they can't make their nest in a field. in a field. But they can't make their nest in But if they made their nest in your house, the chenyone are the souls. Doves Potter mishiloach. There would be no den of shiloach because it, it, it doesn't go beyond the case of mizuman. So this law is derived from the verse ki kare when it happens, which excludes a case where the nest is in one's possession. The Gemara pl- explains that if one's courtyard acquires the eggs, it is considered in one's possession, and one cannot fulfill the mitzvah. So, for example, your chutzer is kona. What is in the chutzer? So, if the nest is in your your courtyard. Mm-hmm. You basically own it. As long as the mother bird did not rise from sitting upon the eggs, though, the courtyard does not acquire it, as the person himself cannot reach the eggs while the mother is sitting on them. For your chutzer to acquire something that is in your chutzer, you have to have free and easy access to it. Since the mother is on it, you don't have free and access easy to it. So you still haven't acquired it yet. But as soon as the mother leaves the nest, the courtyard immediately acquires it. And then you, then, then you have the problem of mizuman. So it's sort of a catch-22. You would not be Mekayim the Mitzvah. Let's see the Gemara in Chulun. Ton Rabbonah. Yone Shavach v'yone Aliyah. Right? These birds, doves, chayovas b'shiluach. They're the kinds of birds that you wouldn't have to send away. We're going to see very soon that we're talking about kosher birds. Non, there's no Mitzvah by non-kosher birds. Now, what if it's a suffix? So we'll deal with that. But 
In general, we're talking about kosher birds. Doves are pigeons and, and doves are kosher. So they're chayv and shiluach. Vasurus mishum gezem, they dark are shalom. Not only that, you shouldn't take them because in, in a sense, your neighbors will be upset. Maybe it belongs to him. Vim isalah, da'am rav yosi rav chanina chatzir shalom kona lo shalom idaito. Now, according to the opinion of Rabbi Yossi, a person's courtyard acquires something even against his will. I mean, even if he doesn't know about it, his courtyard acquires it. Kori kan ki kare, prat le mezuman. We have a problem since the Torah says ki kare, excluding mezuman. Omer Rav, beitza, im yitzias rubo hudachai v'shiluach. It means once a mother is giving birth to an egg and the majority of the egg is laid, there's already a chi of shiluach. On the other hand, until the egg actually drops onto your chatzah, you're not, you don't acquire it. If you're going to tell me it's chayv and shiluch, it's mekaymet the tipel chatzero. It obviously occurred before it dropped on your chatzah, while it's sort of in transit between the the womb of the of the chicken and the and the cartier. Now. If it doesn't belong to anybody yet, why should it be Osmi Shum Gezel? So the Gemara says, Aima. We're not talking about the Beitza here, we're talking about the mother. Or if you say, Mala Olama Beitza, or Beitza, Kivan the Nafak Ruba, once the egg is 50% out, the Asya, the As, Daita Ale. So, so his Das already is on it, and therefore he would acquire it. And therefore, if you took it, there'd be Gezel. Ashadam Rav Yehuda, Amarav, Osul Zakos, but Beitzim, Shaim Rovetz Saleh. You cannot be Zoycha. You cannot acquire through zechia through this act where I'm zoicha something while a mother's still sitting on it. Shenamar shaleach hasaim v'hoder abonim tikach lach. First, you have to send the mother and then take the child. Filu tema afal gav denofal chatzero kol echo dihim watzi zochi chatzero nami zochi. If he can be zoicha it, his chatzero can be zoicha it, and that's when the mother is not on it. The kol echo dihim lo watzi zochi. But if he can't be zochah on the beitzim because the mother is still on it, so it's chatzir and nami lo So according to this principle, as soon as the mother bird flies out of the nest, the owner of the property has acquired the child and could no longer fulfill the mitzvah. This halach is relevant to the case of a nest located anywhere in one's property, including one's yard, on one's windowsill, and like. And that's what the Shulchan Aruch brings in your idea. Kana mezuman etzlo. You have a nest that is in his house. Kigonyonim. It, it, they, will, they will live with us in our homes. Or you have geese or chickens that made their nest in the house. So the din is, But if you have these doves or pigeons in an attic, or you have birds that have nested in shrubs and ditches, or in an orchard, That's as long as the mother hasn't been raised above the eggs since she laid them. It means she, she, but she's not on them yet. So if the mother's on them, So if the mother bird has left it and, and not on top of the chickens and it's in your already. courtyard, you already own it. So you don't have to... So who's watching? And there would be no chiyu. No However, Rav Moshe proposed the following suggestion. For those who wish to fulfill the mitzvah with a nest on their property, if one sees a bird making a nest on his property, he may have in mind, before the bird lays eggs, mm. that his property should not be kona the eggs. If so, he can fulfill the mitzvah, since they won't belong to him and will not be considered in his possession. It'll, be vo- it'll avoid the mizuman problem. Let's see the egress moisture inside. Beitzim shehut lu b'rshuso. If you have eggs that were, were laid in his rishus, vulva ha'em mehem, and the, the mother left them, avalai sadaito lezakus mehem, but he doesn't want to be coined to them, im yoch l'kai mitzvah shiloch ha'kein, that was what he was at. Ashiv b'kitzur. Rav Moshe says, I will answer sh- shortly. Sharak abit siporim b'biros means birds out in the field. It's only those kind of things 
that a chot, it'll be considered as a chot search kishuhug ba'em alem if the bird was lifted. Mishum shadaitel zakos ben because then his mind will be to acquire those birds. But v'lo be'beitzim she'ain daitel zakos ben. But if the person could keep, if the person could have in his mind that I don't want to be zolcha the bird, the eggs, perhaps the eggs will stay out of him. The gam pichlal gabit sipor v'avzav tana goylim im echad toin she'ain zes chut b'shvilo. For example, says I don't want these eggs. It's not a schus for me. V'lo ratzel zakos yesh lamino gam lamafreya. So we can, uh, retroactively we would believe him. It's a way sort of, if, if you can see the bird nesting, you can already make a, 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 a in comment, I don't want those eggs. And then later on you'd be able to, pop, you know, give a potch, the bird flies away, unless we hold it, you have to actually do it. We'll see. Some say you'll have to actually grab its foot or grab its wing. Some say you can, if you just potch it, it flies away, and, and you did an action, we'll see whether that works as well. So some other contemporary posting, including the Petine Halacha and the Sefer Shalech to Shalach, which is a book just about Shalach HaKain, agree with the suggestion of, of Rav Moshe. But by contrast, Rav Shlomo Zarm argues that even in a case where one intends not to acquire the nest and the eggs, he still may not fulfill the mitzvah, since at any moment he can acquire the nest through his court, courtyard, if he so desires. Since he has, at any time he can be coined, therefore is considered still to be Mizman readily available. This was pointing out Walter's point. If it was really easy to know, a mitzvah that has uh, such a schus, obviously it's not that easy to be a kind of it. So, uh, the, 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 if you don't fulfill all the gedorim of the mitzvah, whether it is that you have to have a desire for the eggs, and if you don't, maybe you're... The, so just because you go and look for it, it you've got to fulfill all of these various gedorim in order for there to be a kiyuma mitzvah. Let's just see the Minchas Shloimeh. Yeah, but the guy, the guy who wants to do that kind of a mitzvah has already learned the more than I guess. You know, somebody, let's say somebody somebody wants to have Arichas Yom or somebody wants to have a child, whatever. So they go learn all the mitzvahs, they come across this thing, and then they know what So Eina Chanami. Eina Chanami. If he, 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 people do come across, uh, you know, these nests. So Eina Chanami, if he's prepared, he'll be prepared. That if you have a courtyard that's watched, he's talking about Rav Moshe's leniency. That he'll keep, he'll have in mind not to be zoicha. That it'll be easy for him to make the mitzvah. Even the ends of zuman, but ulaniyas daiti yesh lefak pek bezeh. You have to question that. Uktsa sad lekach. The imlo ken yachol kol adam lachnis toch pe so kluv im tarnagolus. Shemor, a person could sort of create a nest. And he could be mafkirit, imatzipur, v'liglos, daito, I'm called beitzim, and everyone So Rav Moshe is saying, if, 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 there was, if you could do it this way, you could sort of set up this whole mitzvah. Right. Obviously, you, think, you see, it's not supposed to be that easy to do it. Yeah, because it says that you come across it by mistake, I mean, just by happenstance. That's why you can't set it up. Okay. Then it wouldn't be the mitzvah. Okay, very good. Um, Shukoyev, next Tuesday night, 8 o'clock. I'll send out reminders to everybody. And thank you, Rav Duran, for joining us. Wow. Let's see.